So, in the last two segments, we saw the, the, the Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions of motion. And in particular, we use this uh, very fundamental idea of rigid body motions to elucidate the two different descriptions, okay? And in particular, we saw that it's possible to go from one type of motion to the other, which we did by simply inverting the point-to-point -point map, right? Um, now, if you think about it, that is a little unsatisfactory simply because we had to go through the, through the step of actually inverting the map, okay? So what we've seen so far is that uh, one can convert, one can rewrite Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions of motion right in terms of each other we can write them in terms of each other by inverting the point to point map phi of x comma t equals little x, right? This is one way in which we can go from one to the other, okay? Uh, in particular, what we, can, what we can do is to simply say that x can be written as phi inverse of little x at the same time t, okay? Now, in general, inverting functions is um, not pleasant business. Uh, in many cases, that inversion may not be easy to get at. Okay, so whereas it is convenient as a formal description, as a, as a formal uh, justifica justification for this uh, relation between Lagrangian and Eulerian description, uh, we shouldn't rely upon being able to invert that motion every time. Okay? Um, so let, let me just complete the statement by saying, okay, so for example, what we did last time, what we've done in the previous two uh, segments was to observe that if x is c function of time plus q function of time um, acting on x, we can always write back x equals q transpose function of time acting on little x minus c, right? We can do this. But like I've been saying, uh, this is not the best way to go about things. In particular, what we need in order to have a, you know, wide, um, in order to make possible a wide usage of this relation between Lagrangian and Eulerian descriptions and to go quickly between one and the other is a way to write uh, these two motions even when we don't invert the point-to-point -point map, okay? So, so here's the question. Okay, uh, how can we write the relation the relations for, in particular, how do we write the relations for the Eulerian quantities, okay, V the velocity and A the Eulerian acceleration without inverting the 
the motion phi. Okay? So that's what we need to do. Of course, we can do this, and the way we do this is um, fairly straightforward. It is essentially the chain rule. Okay? Okay? It is essentially the chain rule, uh, but because of its use in particular in describing quantities that involve time derivatives, it also gives rise to a new, um, more detailed notion of time derivatives here. Okay? So in particular, what we are going to see is we are going to look at something called the material time derivative. Okay? And the idea is really quite simple. Uh, the idea is that the idea of the material time derivative is one where we are computing the time derivative uh, by holding the reference position fixed. Okay? So the material time derivative is um, a time derivative holding capital X fixed. Okay? And the place it is applied here is in writing out the Eulerian acceleration. Okay, so we're going to apply it to writing out the Eulerian acceleration. Okay, A of little x comma t and we're going to use the fact that the Eulerian and Lagrangian acceleration are indeed the same physical quantity. It's just a matter of how we parameterize them. Okay? One way to look at it is by saying that, well, uh, back here we have the, the Lagrangian acceleration, right? And back here we have the Eulerian acceleration. They're both the same, right? They're the same physical quantity, but clearly, the Lagrangian acceleration is parameterized by the reference position, okay? Okay? Whereas the Eulerian acceleration is being parameterized by the spatial position, right? The current position of the particle of interest. Well, you know, if, if we're going to parameterize the same quantity by different arguments, uh, we should expect that the functions of those arguments are not going to be the same. So capital A is some function of capital X, but little a is a different function of little x. Okay, and this is why we use little a and capital A to, to distinguish between the Eulerian and Lagrangian accelerations. Okay? Anyhow, but, but that, that, that's obviously not the bulk of what we want to say and do here. Okay, so let's look at this again. So, uh, if that is the case, what we want to do here is write out the, uh, the Eulerian acceleration using the fact that it is indeed the same physical quantity as the Lagrangian acceleration, which implies that it must be this same time derivative, okay? The time derivative of the Lagrangian velocity, okay? And I'm going to make explicit this idea that this time derivative I've written out on the right-hand side is computed with capital X fixed. Okay? It's computed at a capital X. Okay? But then that implies as well that we can write this out as the time derivative of little v. Okay? But now little v is parameterized by little x and t. 
okay. We are talking the same time derivative now, okay, except that instead of writing the function whose time derivative we are taking as being parameterized by the reference position, we want to talk about it as being parameterized, we want to think about it as being parameterized by the spatial position. But do it very carefully because what are we holding fixed here, right? We want to do this holding capital X fixed, right? Remember this, okay? So we are doing this by recalling, by remembering for us that little x here is phi of capital X and T, okay? And it is that capital X that we want to hold fixed here, okay? All right, um, that's what we want to know. That's what we want to remember here. Okay, so maybe I should I should even annotate this further by saying, x here, capital X here is fixed, and here too I'm going to say, capital X is fixed. Okay, this is what we're trying to do here. Well, once we recognize that and we're disciplined about remembering what we're holding fixed, this is, this is actually very straightforward, right? Because what this simply means now is that we want to write this as follows, right? Observe that uh, in what we've written here on the extreme right-hand side, there are two sources or two origins for time dependence, right? There is time dependence explicitly on time, on t here, right? Okay, so this is what we may call the explicit time dependence. Right? And back here, we have an implicit time dependence. Okay, so when we do this, we realize that, well, this is really not that difficult at all, is it? It really is, is it can be written now as the following, right? The simple partial time derivative of V, okay? So if we knew nothing about holding capital X fixed, the way we would calculate the time derivative would be in terms of a partial time derivative of little v, right? parameterized by little x and time, okay? And in doing this, we would be holding little x fixed, okay? And we will do that here, but that's not the whole story, okay? There is a further dependence here, okay? And like I said before, this just comes about from the chain rule. Because v also has an implicit dependence upon time, right? We need to account for that. And that implicit dependence upon time is through little x, okay? So we have this times, uh, let me just write this as little x with respect to time. And I should make clear that these are separated, okay? This is just the chain rule if you look at it carefully. Okay, so let me state here that what I have here is the chain rule. 